Hi guys and welcome to a new video. Today we are back with some true crime and this time we're going to be talking about an unsolved disappearance from the 70s that still hasn't been solved to this day. Um, I'd like to thank my mom for telling me about this case. I definitely did not know anything about this before she told me about it, but it actually happened in her hometown when she was growing up. Uh, if you don't know, I am half American. My mother's side of the family comes from the States and they grew up in Glenview, just outside of Chicago. And this is a case that took place in that very town. I spent every summer going there as a kid and it was just a bit wild to me that I probably passed that house quite a few times. So today's case is going to be about Helen Brock. If you have never heard of that name, she is also known as the Candy Lady or the Candy Heiress to the Brock Company. And also, if you haven't heard of Brock, I think if you're American, you most likely have heard of Brock's confections or Brock's sweets because Brock's confections is a sweets and candy company that was founded in 1904 by Emile Brock. I'm just going to give a little bit of background on that company before I dive into the case just because I find it fascinating and also because I think it provides just a little bit of context in regards to the money involved in this case. Emil Brock was born in Germany in 1859 and his family actually moved to Iowa in 1866. In 1880, he decided to move to Chicago and started working at a candy making company. He was a very successful businessman. He made a lot of sales and managed to save quite a lot of money. And while he was working for this candy making company, he quickly realized that he could do better himself, that he could start his own candy making company and do much, much better. So in 1904, he decided to invest a thousand dollars, which in today's dollars would be about 30,000 into a storefront candy store that he named Brack's Palace of Sweets. Emile Brack had two sons, Frank and Edwin, and they both worked for him in this company. They were both a huge part of this company and they were really good at what they did. It was a family owned business and in no time the company became an empire. I'm going to give you a couple of facts and numbers just to give you an idea of how influential this company was. Brack's Confections was the first to establish a food safety lab to test for purity of the candy. By 1923, Brock had four factories producing over 127 varieties of sweets. Brock also supplied most of the candy that was in emergency rations in World War II. In 1958, Brock's introduced the pick -a mix concept, which was revolutionary. It meant that now there wasn't so much of a need for candy stores that they could just outsource to supermarkets and people could just pick and mix. I mean, it's still available to, like, I still use Pick and Mix. I, I, I don't know if it's called Pick and Mix in the States and Pick and Mix in the UK. I've only heard of Pick and Mix, and I, literally every single time I go to the store, I grab candy from there. That's how influential Brack was. It's like, he introduced that concept, and it meant that supermarkets could now purchase directly from the candy store. In 1987... The company was purchased for $733 million before undergoing a huge makeover. If you still don't quite recognize the name, maybe you're not from the US and you're like, I have no idea what Breck is about. You might recognize these sweets. Candy corn, conversation hearts, jelly bird eggs, double dip peanuts, and lemon drops. It's definitely a huge company and I think most people have accidentally seen or heard about it without realizing that this was an empire that was built in the early 1900s and still lives to this day. Now, if you're asking what Helen, the main protagonist in this case, has to do with the Brock company is, if you remember, I mentioned that Emile had two sons, Frank and Edwin and Frank ended up marrying Helen, which then made her Helen Voorhees Brock. And now I'm gonna do a little bit of backstory on Helen just before we dive into the case, just to give you an idea of what she was like as a person, just to give you a little bit more information about Helen. So Helen was born in Ohio on November 10th, 1911, and she was raised on a small farm. She came from a working class family, 
Her dad was a streetcar driver. Her mom was a stay-at-home mom. She was a housewife. And Helen was always very beautiful. She had this gorgeous red hair. She definitely got noticed a lot. And she actually ended up marrying her high school sweetheart when she was only 17. But unfortunately, they got divorced by the time she was 21. It is said that she got a lot of attention, but she had a lot of issues trying to get men to stick around. So she would end up dating quite a few men, but it never lasted very long. And she was really looking for a relationship and she was really looking to settle down with someone. She worked a couple of odd jobs around Ohio. She even worked at a pottery making factory. And eventually she decided she had had enough and that she wanted to go for something new. She wanted to see what the world had to offer to her. So she decided to move to Florida. More specifically, she was moving to Miami and she did mention to her friends that she was just looking for a rich man that she could marry or a wealthy man that she could marry. Not just for the money. I think she was just tired of living her working class life and she just wanted a better life for herself. So she was in that mindset to find herself a man that had money as well. She ended up getting a job at the Indian Creek Country Club in Miami where she was a hat check girl, which is basically the people, it's kind of like a coat check person. The people you give your coats and maybe hats to and they hold on to them and then they give them back to you on your way out. And that's where she met Frank Brock, Candy King of Chicago. And by that time, she was 39. She wasn't that young anymore. You might think from the way I'm telling the story that she was 23 and a bit of a gold digger, but she was actually 39 and he was 54. And she was still absolutely stunning and she had no problem charming Frank Brock. And he was still married at the time actually, but within a year, his rocky marriage fell apart and he was married to Helen. He immediately moved in with him in their 18 bedroom mansion in Glenview. It is an absolutely stunning house. I, I, I wouldn't even call it a house. It has 18 bedrooms. That's absolutely wild. But they moved in together there. Obviously they were already married and they also had a house built in South Florida and they oftentimes traveled between the two places. Frank had quite a lot of race horses. He was very passionate about horse racing. He spent a lot of his time going to races and hanging out there, having dinner with his friends. Just, I guess if you have that amount of money, that's all you do all day is just <laughs> race horses. That's what I picture rich people doing. But he introduced Helen to the world of horse racing and she really loved it. She always loved animals, so she was really into it. And in 1965, Frank's brother actually passed away. Edwin passed away, meaning that Frank was now the sole heir to the Brock fortune. Only a year later, in 1966, he decided to sell the company because he was no longer really passionate about it. He was getting a bit older. He was now married to Helen. He just wanted to relax, enjoy his life with her, and shower her with gifts. He bought her a Cadillac. He bought her cars. What's quite nice is that she had a Cadillac and she also had, what else did she have? And she also had a Rolls Royce. I mean, they had quite a few cars, but she had them in the Brock's Confections colors. So like the, the brand colors. In 1966, the company sold for $136 million, which is over a billion dollars in today's currency, which is just wild. And unfortunately, Frank didn't get to spend that much time with his wife because 29th of January, 1970, Frank passed away, which left Helen all on her own with a beautiful estate, five luxury cars, and a multi-million dollar fortune. While doing my research about Helen and Frank, upon his death, it is said that she inherited a $30 million fortune, but the company was worth way more than that. So. I don't know if that counted, you know, the, the mansion she had or the real estate she had. She was definitely extremely wealthy. So I, I would say at the very least 30 million, but I did see numbers go up to 100 million. Whichever it was, she was filthy rich, but she didn't really care about that anymore. She never really mixed with the Chicago crowd that he was involved with. And she was really sad. Her husband passed away. Even though she had initially set off to find herself a husband that had money, that doesn't mean she didn't love Frank. She genuinely loved Frank. And now she was left all on her own 
with a lot of money, but also just memories of her husband and nothing else. She very quickly grew reclusive, became a little bit eccentric. She decided to surround herself with a dozen of dogs and putting all of her energy and focus into animal welfare. And actually in 1974, she used she used part of her fortune to set up an animal rights foundation that still runs to this day, which is the Helen Brack Foundation. For about three years after Frank's death, Helen really seemed to focus on the animals and the charity, and she actually ended up looking into buying and selling horses. Frank had introduced her to the horse racing world, and she really loved horses, so she ended up being introduced to a certain Richard Bailey in 1973. Now, Richard Bailey actually owned his own stable in Florida, and he was definitely a well-known character. He owned horses, he was very involved in horse racing, he knew everything there was to know about horses. So she got in contact with him regarding buying and selling horses. Now, he was 20 years younger than she was. At that point, she was 63 and he was 44 and he was extremely charming. She was very smitten with him, he took her out dancing, he was very gentlemanly. <laughs> really gave her a lot of attention and I think that's exactly what she was looking for in a way her husband had passed away she was very lonely and here comes this man who's 20 years younger and really she doesn't need any money she's just looking for company and he's doing exactly that he is charming his way into her life they really seem to enjoy each other's company a lot of her friends mentioned that they had no idea what she saw in Richard Bailey but he seemed to be very sensitive and caring and she was happy so that's all that mattered to her friends and to Helen was that she was happy however you cannot move past the fact that she's a multi-millionaire and this guy is 20 years younger I don't believe she was naive enough to think that he could be after her money but to be fair I think she had so much money that she was thinking if we like each other I'm more than happy to share my wealth with someone who loves me and someone I want to be with so she must have considered the fact that maybe he was after her for the money but because she was so happy with him it, did, it wasn't an issue for her she, she just loved him unfortunately for her Richard Bailey was not only here just to woo her and show her a good time. When she mentioned she was interested in buying and selling horses, his little ears perked up, and he owned his own stable, so he told her he would help set her up. Richard ended up buying three completely useless and run-down race horses for $18,000, and he sold them to Helen for $98,000, making a ridiculous amount of profit in the mix. Now this is obviously a scam, but unfortunately this entire genre of scam was a thing from the 70s to the 90s. It had an entire name to it. It's called the horse murder scandal. If you want to read more about it, it's extremely disheartening, but basically the concept is these con men, mostly men, would purchase or would sell horses to wealthy people, horses that wouldn't perform very well, pick out an insurance policy on the horse and then find a way to kill the horse so that they could cash in on the insurance money. Some of the horses were either overvalued or underperforming so the conspirators would kill the horse before the owners could find out just how bad these race horses were. They were obviously not winning any races and Helen actually never really paid attention to that. She ended up, so the three horses that Richard sold her never won any races but it's speculated that she never really paid attention to that. I don't think she invested in those horses to make more money. She didn't need to, she had so much money. Um, it is believed that she was just happy to kind of help Richard out by buying these horses off him and maybe help support his business and just give him a little bit more money through, you know, work. I don't think Helen found out in time, but Richard unfortunately had done this before to other very wealthy widows. He would, charm his way into their lives as soon as he found out that they were very wealthy maybe they had just divorced maybe their husband had just passed away they had a lot of money and he was extremely charming and unfortunately helen was his latest victim and nothing more than that he managed to convince helen to buy a group of breeding horses which would cost her another one hundred and fifty thousand dollars which not, might not seem like much given her fortune, but it's still a huge purchase. And remember, she is coming from a very humble background. She grew up on a farm. So it's not like she was raised in this wealth 
and that she had no concept of money. She, she really did. So she started growing very suspicious of these horses and the, the price. So she ended up hiring an appraiser just to look into it to see if the horses were actually worth that much. And of course, the appraiser immediately told her to not spend another dime on these horses because they were absolutely not worth anywhere near the price she was paying for them. Obviously, once Helen found out, she was absolutely furious at Richard because she did not like being conned. She did not like being cheated and especially from someone she was dating and that she actually really liked and that she had feelings for. She obviously was disgusted by this behavior and she was absolutely fuming. <laughs> she was furious at Richard because on top of you know conning her and taking her money and basically scamming her, he, she ended up realizing that a lot of these horses would end up being killed and now this is someone who's really invested in animal welfare. She has her own charity to protect animals. She loves horses and here she is dating this man who's not only taking her money but on top of that killing horses just to get more money. She was absolutely disgusted with his behavior and she made it very clear to Richard that she knew exactly what was going on. She shouted at him in front of a couple of friends she made it very clear that she never wanted to see him again and that she was going to take him to court and prosecute him. She also told a friend that in confidence that she was going to take him to court and she was going to press charges and that he would pay for what he did to her and the others. Now she planned on going to the local district attorney after a checkup with her doctor at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Obviously she is from Chicago, also in South Florida, but the Mayo Clinic is one of the best and she can afford it. So she took almost a week off. She had a few days to do a full checkup with her doctor. So she went up to Minnesota. She spent a few days at the clinic and she left on February 17th, 1977. She had gotten a clean bill of health, although she was a little bit overweight, but that was absolutely fine. Aside from that, everything was going well with her. She was very healthy. And at the clinic gift shop, she ended up buying a couple of cosmetics just before leaving the place. And the shop assistant remembers her stopping by to purchase a few things. And Helen told the shop assistant to please hurry up, my houseman is waiting. And that was the last time Helen Brock had ever been seen. She was registered for a flight back to Chicago that very afternoon. However, none of the crew on board remember anyone matching her description. So it looked like she had never actually made it onto the plane. And remember she was telling the shop assistant, please hurry, my houseman is waiting. Now the houseman in question is none other than John Matlick, also known as Jack Matlick. And he was hired by Frank in 1959 to basically chauffeur them around, but then when Frank passed away, Helen decided to just basically let him run the Glenview property. So he was now referred to as a houseman because he was no longer just her driver. He also kind of ran the whole estate. And before I go any further than that, I find it very odd that she would say at the clinic shop, my houseman is waiting. Can you please hurry when she's about to board a flight? Because surely you would, if you're in a rush and you're about to board a flight, Surely you would just say, could you please hurry? I have to catch my flight. So it makes me think, was Jack Matlick with her in Minnesota? And was he waiting outside in the car? What's going on? Surely that is such an odd phrasing. If you're going to catch a flight, who cares if your houseman is waiting at home? You're going to get there when the plane gets there. That's just the end of it. But I just found that phrasing to be a little bit odd. And I'll get back into that in a second. But... The bottom line is, Helen was never seen after interacting with that shop assistant. Police ended up interviewing everyone who was close to her, specifically Jack Matlick, the houseman, who informed investigators that he had picked her up from O'Hare Airport, which is the Chicago airport, and he had picked her up on the 17th, driven her back to her house, where she spent the rest of the weekend, because that was on a Thursday, so she allegedly was driven back to her house by Jack Matlick on the 17th and then spent the rest of the week, including the weekend, just on her own. Jack Matlick explains that Helen spent the entire rest of the week on her own, not speaking to anyone. She had essentially locked herself in her room. The only person she met up with was this man he had never seen before. 
And it was very odd because Helen would usually spend her weekend talking to friends, calling them. And most of her friends who called during that weekend were informed by Jack Matlick that she would phone them back when she felt up to it. He made it sound like she didn't really want to talk to anyone. She just wanted to be on her own. She locked herself up in her room. And even he didn't really see her that much. He also mentioned that she had an early morning flight to Florida on Monday. So that was the last time he had allegedly seen her. According to Jack Matlick, she was headed to Florida to handle a real estate transaction. And he was going to drive her to the airport Monday morning very early so that she could catch her 9 o'clock flight. To make it in time for that 9 a.m. flight, Matlick said that they left at around 7 o'clock. She actually woke up at 6 in the morning and he dropped her off at the airport and never heard from her ever again. Oddly enough, Matlick waited two weeks before reporting her missing. And the first thing he did was to contact Helen's brother, Charles, who ended up flying down to Illinois to help find out what was going on and if there were any clues in the house. So they both searched the house. They both found her diaries, which she had been writing in for years, like every day she would write in her diary. Now, Charles claims that Helen had informed them that if anything were to happen to her, that she would want her diaries to be burned, which is exactly what he ended up doing. He completely burned her diaries with the blessing of Jack Matlick, who had clearly nothing to do with these diaries. And also, why would you burn diaries in the event that something happened? How do you know something happened? She's been missing for two weeks, but... How would you know for sure that she's not coming back? So things are already starting to look a little bit suspicious, right? The authorities decided to focus on Jack Matlick. Obviously, he's the houseman and he was the last one to allegedly see Helen Brack alive. So he interviewed him a few times. None of his stories were adding up. He was coming out with different versions. Now, first of all, one thing that's important to know is that Helen Brack was absolutely not a morning person whatsoever. So a lot of people found it very, very hard to believe that she would sign herself up for a very early morning flight on a Monday to go down to Florida for a real estate transaction that could surely be postponed to later in the day. So, and it's not completely, you know, it's not entirely impossible that she, she finally woke up early one day just because she's not a morning person doesn't mean she can't wake up early. However, when police looked into the flight that Jack Matlig was talking about, they found out that there was no 9 a.m. flight to Florida on a Monday. So it, she couldn't have left for Florida on that flight, as he explained. And on top of that, Helen had a friend called Douglas Stevens who would essentially come to pick her up in Florida whenever she would fly down there. So she would always let him know when she was coming down to Florida, he would pick her up from the airport. It had always been that way. She had never gone to Florida and taken a cab. She she would just always call Douglas and he had no idea she was coming down to Florida. She had never let him know that she was on her way. Now, again, it's out of character, but that doesn't mean she wasn't headed down there. But that between, between the fact that Douglas had no idea she was coming and the fact that that 9 a.m. flight does not exist, it really starts to make you wonder whether or not she was headed to Florida. This case is actually very very frustrating because police spoke to Matlick's wife and she told police that he told her that he was waiting for Helen to come back from the Mayo Clinic and he waited all weekend and she never made it back. She also explained that during that weekend, Jack had arranged for two of the rooms in the Glenview home to be repainted, one of them to be recarpeted. And when police spoke to the workers, they said that nothing seemed out of the ordinary. They never saw Helen back, but she was allegedly locked into her room. But given what Jack had allegedly told his wife, he said that she never made it back from the clinic. So which was it? Did she make it back from the clinic and then lock herself into her room? Or did she never make it back and he was just kind of waiting there all weekend for her to come back and he like, whatever she is, and then waited another two weeks to call in the police. It's just, there's too many things and you know what, I'm not going to start conspiracies or theories before I'm done talking about the entire case just because there's so much to go through. To really cement my whole suspicions about Matlick's involvement, he ended up forging three checks worth a total of $13,000. 
he signed Helen's name, obviously forged the signature, and he also ended up stealing currency and jewelry from her house. He failed two lie detector tests, which means nothing at all, to be honest. It's a bit of a garbage science, but he failed two lie detector tests, and I don't know if back then they held a little bit more proof than they do now. I don't think now they can be used in court. But police also found out that he had one of her Cadillacs detailed, completely cleaned inside and out, and also ordered a meat grinder attachment from Marshall Fields that very weekend, which is such an odd purchase, right? Like, I can't be the only one who finds that extremely suspicious. And to make things worse as well is that Charles Voorhees, who came down to Illinois to check the house and burn her diaries, never suspected Jack Matlick of anything. He believes that Jack Matlick is 100% innocent and Jack Matlick was never charged with any crime. And he spent the rest of his life claiming he was innocent and knew absolutely nothing about Helen's disappearance. Now, if you're wondering how he managed to not get charged with any crime whatsoever, even though he did forge those checks, that is solid proof that, you know, he is a criminal. He forged those checks. He didn't try to deny that. The reason he never got taken to court for that is because he entered an agreement stating that he would forego the $50,000 he was meant to inherit from Helen in exchange for no charges being pressed. So he avoided going to jail for that forgery, but he also had to bypass the money he was allegedly, the, the money he was meant to get from Helen's inheritance. Somehow police just lost interest in Jack Matlick and, and, and they just left it at that. The, the case grew cold. Like they, they didn't try and get more information from Jack Matlick, even though his stories were inconsistent. There was a lot of suspicious activity going on that weekend and none of his stories lined up. The police just kind of, just kind of moved on. Now, of course, police interviewed Richard Bailey, who was very close to her. They were daters, lovers, whatever you want to call it. They were together for quite a while. So they got in contact with Richard Bailey, who was staying in Palm Beach with a young woman. So he was already with someone else. And Richard claimed that Matlick had called him to tell him that Helen was arriving in Florida on a Monday morning. Richard Bailey was looking forward to seeing her. However, she never made it to Florida. So Richard Bailey said that he called the house a few times and Jack kept saying, no, she's not here. You know, call back, call back later, but she's not home. That doesn't make any sense because obviously if Jack Matlick contacted Richard Bailey to tell him that she was on her way to Florida and Richard wanted to see her and then Richard calls back saying she's not here where is she, she he's like she she's not home man she's, she's just not home like he knows she's meant to be in Florida surely you'd say like what do you mean she's not in Florida and the and what's crazy is that Richard told police that he gave up he basically assumed that she had moved on with another guy and she didn't want to see him, so he didn't want to push it, so he just left it at that. He just assumed, you know what, she came to Florida, she probably doesn't want to see me, that's that. Which is wild, because he was already with another woman at the time anyway, so... Why would she want to see you? Why would you want to see her? She made it very clear that she never wanted to see you again, she's going to prosecute you, but... That's what, that's the story Richard Bailey went with. And you would think that because Helen is the heiress to a multi-million dollar fortune, that more people would be interested in what happened to her and that police would try and get to the bottom of it. But unfortunately, she didn't have many relatives left. The closest relative she had was her brother, who clearly did not seem curious at all about what happened to her. I mean, he even burned her diaries. So unfortunately, the clues dried up pretty quickly and the case grew cold. About a year later, a message showed up on a sidewalk near the Glenview estate that was spray painted and stated that Richard Bailey knows where Mrs. Brack's body is. Stop him. Obviously, police had to interrogate Richard Bailey again after that message popped up. Nobody really knows where the message came from and who had 
spray painted that message on the sidewalk, but they questioned Richard Bailey again and this time he was not willing to talk. He got an attorney and he completely refused to cooperate. He was released shortly after and in May 1984, a judge declared Helen Brack legally dead. Her entire fortune was divided and most of it went to her foundation. Three years later, in 1987, there was a new lead. Maurice Ferguson claimed that he had been hired to move the remains of Helen Brack from a gravesite and transport them to Minneapolis. Maurice Ferguson claims that Silas James, who was just like Richard Bailey, very involved in organized crime and horse fraud, had hired him to do the transfer of the remains from that gravesite to Minneapolis. And although Silas Jane was in jail around the time Helen was murdered, they still believed he might have had something to do with him because he had been partnered with Richard Bailey. So police did take that lead seriously. They asked Maurice Ferguson to come with them back to Minneapolis to help locate the grave, but nothing was ever found and that was the end of that lead. Two years later, Richard Bailey finally got charged in July 1989 for conspiring, soliciting, and causing Helen's death. The prosecutor argued that Richard and a group of other men would scam wealthy women into buying show horses for more money than they were worth. And also he was charged along with 22 other men for insurance fraud because as I explained, he would insure these horses that were overvalued and then kill the horses and then cash in on the insurance money. Unfortunately, nobody was charged with Helen's murder because there was no body. Theoretically, no one knows for sure that Helen is dead. I mean, she is definitely by now, just because it's 2021. <laughs> she was born in 1911. So um, I, I don't think she's, even if she hadn't been murdered, she would definitely not be alive anymore. But there was no body. There was no proof of murder. There was definitely motive, but that's all there was. It was all circumstantial and there wasn't anything beyond reasonable doubt to indict anyone. So the only thing that was brought up during the court case was the speculation that Helen realized what was going on. Obviously, she, she did realize what was going on is that Richard Bailey had conned her, scammed her, and she was about to blow the whistle and Richard Bailey was having none of that. So he conspired to kill her or have her killed. Now, as I said, Richard Bailey is a very charming young man who thinks he can talk his way out of anything, which is probably how he was so successful for a while at what he did. Um, he was very confident that he would basically manage to sweet talk the judge out of a life sentence. Unfortunately for him, he ended up pleading guilty to racketeering, mail fraud, money laundering, and unlawful money transactions. He got sentenced to 30 years in federal prison due to the murder conspiracy surrounding him. So although he was never officially charged with Helen's murder, there was too much going on to ignore the fact that he was very likely involved with her disappearance and her murder. Now we fast forward to 2005 and a man confessed to authorities that he had shot Helen Brock. Joe Plemons, who was a horseman from Chicago, claims that he received a call for one, from one of Silas Jane's mobsters and he was told to come to his stable in Tinley Park, which is south of Chicago. Now, Joe Plemons, just so you know, is involved in horse fraud. He's just like the rest of the guys. He's a con artist, he's, he's a criminal, and he was in jail at the time of his confession. So he was stating that Silas Jane had one of his men tell Joe Plemons to come to one of his stables in Tinley Park, and once he got to the stable, a Cadillac pulled into the riding ring. And when the trunk was opened, there was Helen Brack's battered body. She appeared to have been severely beaten and Joe Plemons was ordered to shoot Helen or he would be shot himself. So he allegedly shot her twice and then her body was taken to a steel mill to be incinerated. Well, here's the thing though, Joe Plemons had already testified against ba Bailey when Bailey was in court and he claimed that Bailey had offered him $5,000 to dispose of Helen Brack and have her killed. But nothing came of that confession and also nothing came of that second confession where he said that he was the one to shoot Helen Brack 
because he was in jail and he was looking for a plea deal, they couldn't take it seriously enough. And there was no evidence. It was just his word against the world that he had shot Helen because he was hoping to get a reduced sentence in exchange, which seems weird. Imagine admitting to murdering someone to get less jail time for a jail sentence you're already serving. Seems very contradictory. But basically, as reliable as, as the story sounds, I mean, it, it does technically add up. Police and the court couldn't take it seriously because it was just a bunch of con men talking against each other and saying, no, you killed her, no, you killed her, no, he did it, he paid me, I want a reduced sentence. So nothing came of it, which is so infuriating. And it does seem like the most reliable story in a way because it would explain why Jack Matlick had the Cadillac detailed inside out because if she was in the trunk, then you would definitely want to eliminate any evidence. Some officials do believe that Joe Plemons' version of events solves the case, but officially that was absolutely never the case. Joe Plemons tried to really prove that he had the real version by showing police a ring that he had kept from that night. He claimed that when he moved Helen's body out of the trunk, a ring fell off of her. And he kept that ring ever since. He still had it with him, so he turned it into police now. Unfortunately, nobody could confirm that this ring belonged to Helen. None of her friends recognized it and there was no DNA on it to link it back to Helen, which it could be just because so much time had passed. I mean, this is something that happened in the late 70s. It was now 2005. But regardless, there was no way to prove that it belonged to her. So the ring is still in the evidence room in the Glenview Police Department, along with some of her other belongings and nothing came of that either. A few years later, Joe Plemons got diagnosed with cancer. He had to have part of his jaw and mouth removed and he no longer wanted to speak about this case. He just wanted to be left alone. He passed away in 2016. Jack Matlick passed away in 2011. He spent the rest of his life claiming he was innocent and Bailey and Richard Bailey was actually released in 2019. His uh, 30 year sentence was over. So he came out of jail at the age of 89, which is so wild. And also so, so many, so much has happened between that time. It must be such a culture shock to come out of prison at 89 in 2019, only to be hit with coronavirus a few months later. And of course, this being one of the biggest unsolved cases in the States, Richard Bailey was very quickly interviewed which he agreed to. He wanted to talk about it. And in that interview, which you can find on YouTube, he still calls himself the golden tongue for his conversation skills or for his ability to talk his way in and out of everything. And he was asked a few questions. And so one of the questions the interviewer asked was, the time Helen Brack disappeared, she was threatening to file a lawsuit against you. And he said, oh no, no, hell no, 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 none of that. Um, definitely not. And he said, well, people heard that, well, people heard her say that that's what she was going to do. And he said, I know what they said, but no way, shape or form, no. So he's just insisting that she, she never wanted to press charges against him. And the reason he says that is because he insists that she was madly in love with him. They were in love with each other and that she had no interest in pressing charges against him, which is just a blatant lie. And then he was asked, so did Helen Brack ever make it back from the Mayo Clinic or was she abducted in Minnesota? And he said, that's the $65 question. He said, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Which, first of all, you know. <laughs> Second of all, someone knows. So that's just as far as it ever went. No one ever got charged with Helen's disappearance or murder because there is no body, there is no solid evidence, but I also feel like the police did nothing to try and find out what happened to her. What's going on with Jack Matlick's story? He's definitely involved. He gave his wife a completely different version of events. He said that she never made it back from the clinic, but he told police she made it back, didn't speak to anyone over the weekend. Oh, by the way, we repainted two of the rooms, recarpeted one of the rooms, and then detailed the whole car. And, she had a flight on Monday morning to Florida, but she 
obviously that flight didn't exist. So obviously I don't think, I mean, that was a complete lie. I don't think she ever was, I don't think she was ever going to Florida. I don't think she ever made it to Florida. I don't think she made it home because just the fact that she told the shop assistant, my houseman is waiting, makes me think that maybe he picked her up in Minnesota when she was coming out of the clinic. I mean, it's definitely a road trip, but maybe he came with her. Maybe he was her chauffeur and he still drove her around, but just in a different state. It's just wild to me that someone that rich not could not get justice, but I think it's because no, none of her relatives were still alive to care. Her brother definitely didn't care. He's definitely involved somehow. Like, I, I, What do you guys think? I don't even know what to think about this case. This case took me so long to research just because I had such a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that there were allegations and stories, but no hard evidence, no solid evidence of anything. So many twists and turns to go nowhere. Now, whether or not you think Richard Bailey killed her, I personally, that's just my theory. I don't think he killed her himself. I think he's definitely involved, but Richard Bailey and Silas Jane, they're these type of men who have a horse mafia worth of like men working for them. So you would just have someone else do it as Joe Plemons confessed, you know, someone made him kill Helen Brock. Whether or not that happened, I think that's more likely the case than Richard Bailey himself killing Helen Brock. I don't think he's, I don't think he would do the dirty work personally, but we'll never know. And to be fair, he did, he did serve a 30 year sentence, whether or not you think that's enough for what he did. It's definitely a lengthy sentence. So I, I guess some justice was obtained, but I don't even know how to end this video. I don't I don't know what to end because I feel like this I feel like I feel like I'm not done talking. I feel like I I need to give you something to cement this. This is what's so frustrating with unsolved mysteries is that you that's it. That's just that's the end of the story, folks. Like what do you think happened? She's I mean she's she was definitely murdered, you know, and to me there's no doubt that it's because she was threatening to take Richard Bailey down and she she had what over 30 million dollars so she would have the best lawyers to absolutely ruin Richard Bailey's life and I think the worst part being that he wasn't acting alone the horse murder scandal is very much a thing that involved so many men so many people it was just a gang of a gang of mobsters who would just who would make so much money off of insurance fraud that if Richard Bailey went down, everyone else went down. So I'm sure he had connections to say, look, this really rich lady kind of found out what happened. And it's not like the other wealthy widows that he would swindle that, you know, might be devastated, lost a bit of money, but maybe didn't have the same amount of power Helen had to take him to court and absolutely obliterate the whole operation. So, you know, I have no doubt believing that she was murdered because she was about to blow the whistle and ruin the whole operation. But to me, Jack Matlick is 100% involved. I don't know how the brother could be okay. I don't know what he got out of this and would be okay with just being like, I just burned her diaries. It's fine. Like, it's fine, guys. Don't look into it. Look, she's somewhere. First of all, if you're burning the diaries because she told you, look, if anything happens to me, just burn them. How do you know something happened to her? She's only been gone for two weeks. Like just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to end this there guys. Um, had you heard of this story before? I'd never heard of this. Um, Brack candy is still very much alive. They still sell it in estates everywhere. Um, that was the first time I'd ever heard of this case. It was definitely fascinating, but also just equal parts fascinating and infuriating because now we'll never know. Like, we will absolutely never know exactly what happened. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this case. Sorry it took so long for me to post a new video. This took a while to research. Um, I will be back next week, hopefully with another video. Maybe a more recent one. Maybe a solved one, just to give you a bit of solace. If you like this video, please give a thumbs up and please subscribe. And I will catch you next week. Bye.